two, three, four, five, six. Anyone know what the other three are? No, I got those. Translation, rotation, that's six. Six degrees of freedom. So you got three axis accelerometer, three axis gyroscope, and a magnetometer. So what this is doing is it's basically a compass, but a compass that works in, um, presumably, I guess they, they claim in three dimensions. Uh, so that's how they get nine, nine degrees of freedom in this little itsy bitsy uh, integrated circuit. And so stuff like this, you can definitely hook up to your Raspberry Pi. What's, uh, a, what's a GPS bus? Oh, that's a good question. They have a whole section on GPS. Here you go. 50 bucks. Let's see if they have cheaper ones. 40 bucks. Yeah, they're a bit more expensive. Um, so this has an SMA connector, so you can connect it to a, a good antenna. Uh, GPS, obviously, is very heavily, they all have SMAs, very heavily dependent on the antenna that you use. Um, so you'll want to get an additional antenna. Let's see, this looks pretty, this one's for 10 bucks, so let's see what this one has. <laughs> wow, okay. So it has a... Uh, Turn your board on. I'm trying to see, how, look at how you interface with it. Oh, so that's just the board to connect a small GPS to. No, this is the GPS itself. So this is actually the entire GPS system minus your antenna. And so then you would, let's see, it has uh, RX and TX. Uh, that's, is that I, R squared, I squared C? I think that's I squared C. Um, and uh, no, you could, you could definitely hook this up to a I'm not going to say definitely, but I, I believe you could hook this up to a Pi. Um, but if you wanted to pay, let's see what their other boards are. Uh, some of them probably, you know, you probably pay a little bit more and it's going to be a little bit easier for you. So, and they're going to be higher performance too. So this is up, update rates. So update your GPS position up to 20, 20 times a second. Uh, so they claim... Um, here it is. So this uses SPI. Oh, using a, so this will, okay, external logging. Yeah, so you can hook up memory to this one. Um, here, let's see. That. Yeah, same thing. Let's see. Uh, uh, so I think, let's see this works through SPI. SPI stands for Serial Peripheral Interface. Here we go, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, so this actually, this does use SPI. So uh, the SPI interface uses four wires, um, SDA, SCL, as clock, and then MOSI and MISO. Um, and so these are the four, um, you would hook each of these up to the appropriate pin on this, and then you're gonna have to power it so 3.3 volts here. And I bet you could probably power this thing off the Pi itself. So you hook up, because it's so low power, 3.3 um, volts there and then ground there. And I'm not sure what the other stuff does, but um, you can find it, you know, get, get answers to all that if you uh, just grab their, uh, the data sheet, which they always provide. Um, here's, a schema, here's the data sheet. So that's where you would start. Okay, so um, let's see. I got out of my present mode. There we go. So um, once you get your Raspberry Pi actually functional, then um, okay, then what? Um, I'm going to say that the most difficult thing about using a Raspberry Pi, if you don't already know it, is uh, learning Linux. Um, because if you're used to using you know, like, a, like OS X or uh, Windows, um, Microsoft and Apple spend, you know, many millions of dollars to make that user experience as intuitive and, you know, really beautiful and as possible. I mean, that's what people say about, that's what people get Apple products a lot of times because they don't need to read a manual. They just automatically, you know, it's just kind of obvious what you're supposed to do. And Linux isn't quite like that. Um, Linux does involve a, uh, a learning curve. 
but the dividends that you will get if you do anything in tech, in my opinion, or a lot of things in tech, the, from learning Linux are make it just a wonderful investment. And um, um, because it's free and open source, if you have something that you want to give a, a brain to, use Linux. You know, and that's what runs a Raspberry Pi. And um, if you want to see an introduction to Linux, uh, we have, um, I gave a workshop on it maybe a year ago. It's on our Facebook page, I think. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can look at that. Um, but probably a more efficient way of, of using your time is just, you know, click, <laughs> just, just do the tutorials, get your Raspberry Pi working. So instead of watching me talk about Linux, you can actually use it yourself, which is a much better use of your time. And, and much more fun too. Uh, and then of course, uh, you can always get help from uh, all of us at Barn. Uh, Nathan um, uh, is, you know, can answer pretty much all of your uh, hardware questions, or if he can't, he probably knows somebody who does, who can. Um, and uh, you know, the resources that we have here in terms of people uh, are really probably the most valuable thing we have at Barn, so you should uh, take advantage of them. Is there a separate uh, Facebook page for the EPA? Yeah, okay. Um, so beyond, so Linux is the operating system that, you know, uses, that you, that the Pi uses to, to run, you know, and the same, think of it as like, like Windows or like OS X. Um, but in order to actually make your Raspberry Pi do something interesting, you probably want to know uh, some programming. Uh, I mean, whether it's even the really basic stuff, like how to turn an LED light on. Um, and for that, I recommend uh, learning Python. Uh, Python is just a wonderful multi-purpose uh, language. It's used extensively in um, both in industry and in academia. Um, it's got a very active um, open source community. Uh, and it's actually, for, I'd say, really pretty easy to learn as programming languages go. Um, and if you, if you need to get something done, um, Python, if you just want to get something done, like you need to, uh, you know, up, have an email automatically be sent when your garage door opens, then P Python's probably going to get you there the fastest. Um, and so uh, I have a link here to their tutorial. And so if you don't know Python, uh, work through their tutorial, and um, you know you'll 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 pick it up pretty quickly. And so finally, uh, if you want to use the actual the pins on the Raspberry Pi, that's when you want to know a little something about hardware. And, um, you know, like for example, you, you generally don't want to connect an LED light directly to the two pins uh, because your LED light will burn out after about five seconds. And so you have to connect it with a resistor in series. Um, but if you don't know that, then you're going to burn out your LED light and you're going to wonder why it's not working. And so using the GPIO pins does require a little bit of knowledge about hardware and it requires a little bit more care than doing stuff in software. If you, if you make a mistake in software, then, you know, it crashes or it just doesn't work. Uh, but hardware can be a little bit more frustrating. But it is, uh, you know, essential to doing anything in uh, any, any kind of physical computing, you know, whether it's robotics or, uh, you know, even something as simple as turning on a switch. You have to know something about hardware. And so I put a link to um, a tutorial on, I think that's, uh, um, I can't remember if this one, here, let's take a look. If Raspberry Pi actually themselves, yeah, they do. So this is, you know, a whole introduction that Raspberry Pi themselves has for how to use the GPIO pins, uh, how to configure them, and, ah, warning. <laughs> so this is, this is one of the only places that you, you, you know, it is possible, at least theoretically, to fry your Pi. Um, and, uh, you know, so it says basically here, uh, this is the general rule of thumb. Don't try and connect stuff to the Pi that uses a lot of power. Um, so don't connect motors directly to the Pi. Uh, but again, you know, <laughs> you, you can try, and if you fry your Pi, then you just, you know, you're out 35 bucks. It's not the end of the world. Uh, so don't be afraid to take risks. Um, let's see. And uh, for general tutorials on how to use the Raspberry Pi itself, I've got a link here on the slides. Um, and so if you just want to get up and running quickly with your Pi or want to take the next couple of steps beyond this workshop, then uh, you can get the instructions there. Okay, so enough of me talking. 
Uh, let's actually get these pies configured and working. Um, Where are you going to put the, the slides? Well, I don't know. I haven't figured out yet. There's there, probably SlideShare. SlideShare is like a, you know, it's a yeah. slide sharing site. We'll, we'll, we'll send the link out to everybody. Um, so uh, these are the steps. I did this yesterday at home just to confirm that it all worked. Um, I just bought this uh, this week, and it did. It worked fine. Uh, so the steps are, uh, first I should ask, who brought a Pi? Who wants to configure it? So one, two, three. OK, do you guys have um, the, uh, did you already burn the operating system on the card? Mm -hmm. Yes. If you don't know what I work, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the answer is no. <laughs> oh, we'll take a look. Okay, we'll determine that pretty quickly. Um, and so then, uh, uh, yeah, the, the steps are, you know, if you don't have, if it's not burned, I'll do that for you. It takes about five minutes on uh, my computer, and uh, you won't have to do it again. Uh, and so the, the first step is we'll, we'll plug it into one of our monitors and keyboards so at least you can get it up and running and confirm that it, it's working properly. Um, the default username and passwords that you're going to use are uh, the default username is pi, password raspberry. Uh, first thing you should do is change the default password uh, because you should never, ever, ever use default passwords uh, as a matter of you know, absolutely basic security. Um, and then uh, let's see if we can get connected to our Wi-Fi here on Barn. Um, so you'll use the graphical user interface to hook it up and put in the um, you know, the password for the Wi-Fi that I'll, I'll provide in a second. And uh, make sure you can ping uh, Google. And if, that, if that's working, it looks like everything's good, then you go on to the next step, which is to perform a full system update. And because Raspberry Pi runs uh, Linux, uh, it runs a branch of Linux called Raspbian. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. Debian it, yeah. It's actually a fork of Debian. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a Debian guy. I, this machine runs Debian, and so I'm just used to using aptitude. You can use apt-get. I've yet to determine if there's that much of a difference between the two. Um, but if you see me write ap ap aptitude, you know, you could, you could probably just write apt-get and work fine. Uh, but this is, if you want to set your, if you want to um, burn your image and set it up at home, uh, this is what you download. Uh, I'd recommend, for getting started, just, you know, Download this version. It's like I think like uh, 1.3 gigabytes or something. So it takes a couple minutes if you don't have a super fast connection. This is a really lightweight version of um, of Raspbian that does not come packaged with a lot of uh, you know probably pretty useful software packages. If you are super constrained on space for some reason, then you get that one. But I would just say go ahead and and download this one. I have it here on, on my machine, so you don't don't need to download it now. We'll just burn you a new card. Um, but then uh, the other approach that you can take if you don't want to burn this directly or you, you know, you're, you're a little nervous about it is to use um, something they call noobs. Um, the only reason, and this is a, essentially an installer for the Raspberry Pi software, and the only reason that I don't um, use it is because I never have used it. And uh, uh, for me, it's fairly straightforward and fairly simple just to do, just to you know, download the image, burn it onto your SD card, and then you're done. And so uh, that's, what I'll, um, that's what I'll show everybody. But uh, as a consequence, when you, burn, when you burn an image, you just get you know, whatever, uh, whatever the software was at the time that that image was created. And the thing about Linux is because it's open source and it has a really massive community of people contributing to the software and making the software better, it's continuously changing. And so you need to keep your system up to date. And so the first thing that you should do when you burn a new Raspberry Pi is to do a uh, system upgrade. And these are the two commands right here that will do that for you. And so I'll show you how to do that if you want. And, uh, and if people are interested, I'll go into the details of what all this gobbledygook actually means. Um, and uh, because once you, once you get the hang of it and start using these tools, uh, you'll find them to be uh, tremendously powerful. Then, um, <laughs> I realized this yesterday, because the Raspberry Pi is uh, actually from the UK, uh, like the, t the time zone is set to the UK, the keyboard layout is set to a UK keyboard layout, and <laughs> that can be really annoying. <laughs> so the other first thing, the other thing you want to do is you'll Americanize your Pi, American Pi. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, and so these are the steps to doing, to doing that. So you get the time zone configured, 
the Wi-Fi country configured. I don't know if that's important or not, but you might as well. And so once that's done, then you set up SSH access. So you don't need to use the keyboard and monitor. And so if you take your, if you're going to be using your Pi at home and it's going to be connect, connected to your Wi-Fi network, you'll just have, to, you'll want to configure it um, to work uh, at home on your Wi-Fi network so you don't have to hook up the keyboard and the, uh, the mouse or the, the monitor every time you want to use it. All you need to go is just go to your normal computer and I'll, I'll demonstrate this in a second. You know, log into your Pi and then you can use it. Um, and then when you're done using your Pi, you can either just leave it running uh, because it uses very little power or you can shut it down. And, and you know, one thing you probably noticed about these things is there's no on and off button. <laughs> and uh, you just plug it in. And so when you plug it in, it'll boot. Um, and you probably shouldn't just, when you're done with it, you want to turn it off, you probably shouldn't just pull the, pull the plug. Uh, you should probably shut it down properly uh, so you don't end it up with an um, inconsistent file system. It probably will be fine if you just pulled the plug, but it's better to shut it down using this command here. Um, and that'll shut down your, your, your Pi in a very safe, um, you know, controlled way. Uh, and, uh, and that's basically it. Then the rest is up to you, um, depending on what projects you want to, want to build. Um, that's why I didn't have a step seven in here. And then you'll, uh, make massive profits at some point after that, but we'll have to figure out exactly how. Yes. On your IP addresses, what if you have dynamic IP? Yeah. So there are a couple of things. Um, most people's, uh, if you, if you just have a standard setup, you know, you buy a router on Amazon or something, you'll plug it in and it works. Uh, it's most likely uh, dynamically assigned. And what you want to do is you'll want to go into your router's configuration system and tell it that for the MAC address on your Pi, that to always give it the same IP that you specify. That's all you have to do. But now we take it somewhere else. If you take the Pi somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, well, that's the thing. So if you want your Pi to connect to some, another network, you, yeah, you, you, if your Pi doesn't have its own internet connection, you're going to have to plug it in to a keyboard because otherwise you're not going to be able to talk with it. You, I, no, actually, you probably should be able to do a peer-to-peer. -peer. You should be able to set up a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, ad hoc network with your Pi, you know, using just your computer. I've never done that. But if you figured out how, I, that would be kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, that should be that should be possible. Um, I guess the uh, another thing you could do is you could set up. Uh, yeah, that yeah probably your probably your best bet would be to set configure it to set up a peer to peer ad hoc network. Um, otherwise, um, you you can connect a, a a cellular card to it if you wanted. Um, you can buy actually one of the things that Spark Fun has that are really cool are uh, cellular modules. So if you wanted to, let's say you wanted to build something with your Pi and you wanted to put it up in Alaska somewhere, you know, where there's not going to be any Wi-Fi coverage at all, but you still want to be able to interact with it and read from it, well, you could do it, that, like, you could use one of these. So you hook this thing up. It's actually a cellular module. And um, I think you're going to have to get a SIM card for it, but you can get a SIM card on T-Mobile. I just bought, they're about like 10 bucks or something, and you put on as much money as you want. And as long as you have T-Mobile um, cellular coverage, you would actually be able to access your Pi through the cellular network. So there are, you know, one of the cool things about once you get into Raspberry Pi is there are multiple ways of solving any problem. And so, you know, that, that, is, that is kind of a cool way of doing it. Um, but that's about it. Um, Oh yeah, I've got one here. Yeah. So, yes. I got a question about the little SD card. Yeah. So that's like the brains of the whole thing. Yeah, that's your memory. That's the non-volatile memory. So that's the equivalent of your hard drive. Yeah. So, uh, do you recommend that you sort of make a backup of that somewhere just in case you, something oh. happens to it? Or? Well, it all depends on how important um, you know the stuff is on the card. Yeah, because you should always assume that um, you know. I mean, these things now, now in, in the old days, these things used to be, you know, have gotten a lot better. And so you, know, you can be pretty highly confident that, you know, the, the data that exists on this thing is going to be there tomorrow. Um, but you never know. And so if you have anything that you really don't want to lose, then, yeah, you should make a backup. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. yeah the, the, the quote unquote correct answer is you should always make a backup. But, you know, I would say it all, dep it all depends on what you, you know, <laughs> how important is it to you? Um, the, the other thing about these, like uh, the one I have at home, here, I'll show you actually. You know, this, uh, the old Model Pi uh, has the older style, uh, larger SD cards. And like this SD card probably is like, I don't know, eight years old or something. And they do degrade over time a little bit. And uh, um, yeah, so you should assume that the SD card is not going to be good forever. Any other questions? Because if not, then I say, let's, um, we'll get, we'll burn. If you brought an SD card that you want to be configured, we'll get that started now because that'll take about, you know, five minutes or so and we'll get that going. And if you want to get your, if you already have that set up and you just want to get your Pi working, then we can plug it in here or you can plug it in on a monitor that you brought and, um, and we'll get it working and we'll get SSH set up so you can take it home and use it. Is it the noob software? 